never been a moment you were forgotten you are not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen I've never been good at change If I'm honest, it's always scared me But I can't deny this stirring deep inside me And I know it's time to stop resisting Cause I'm not getting any younger Fear is such a sad way to live a life So face to the wind, I'm jumping out I'm walking in every single thing you want to show me To the ups and downs, the highs and lows The taking in Letting go to the tears and laughter, the great unknown, to the open journey into faith I go. Nobody said this would be easy. Anyone who didn't ever went through. 
something painful But faith is not some fragile thing That shatters when we walk through something hard So we walk on Whatever may come To the ups and downs The highs and lows The taking in And letting go To the tears and laughter The great unknown To the open journey In the faith I go When I feel like giving up When I feel like throwing it all away I look back over my shoulder And I can see your goodness Every single step that I have taken And it beats like a drum And it brings a bell Forget my name, remind me who I am. In the camera, all I show is someone I don't really know. Remind me who I am. In the loneliest places, when I can't remember what grace is. Good morning. Hey, welcome to Grace. My name is Andrew. I'm glad we are here together today. Why don't we stand up as we begin worship, and I want to invite you to join me in this responsive reading, kind of a call to worship, if you will. So you'll see these words on the screens. I'll read the top line, and let's all respond together with uh, the lower, bold, italicized text. Here we are, young and old, the believing and the doubting. The weak and the strong, here God is, almighty and merciful, gracious and just, trustworthy and true. So since we are here and God is here, let us worship God. Will you join me in song?
When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. Let's sing this together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, when all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk in the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. my hands lifted high oh god the battle belongs to you and every fear i lay at your feet i'll sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you and if you are for me who can be Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Come on. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sink through the serve a great God. It is so good to see you this morning. My name is Stephen Ingram, and I want to welcome you to Grace. Uh, whether this is your hundredth time or your very first time, we're so glad to have you uh, in worship this morning and fellowship together uh, here at Grace. At Grace, we are a deep-thinking, warm-hearted, Bible-based, inclusive community of Christ followers, and that's the fellowship that we want to welcome you into uh, this morning as we continue with worship. 
I want to ask that you join me uh, as we pray together. Now, before we do that, I do want to let you know that, that Tyler is not here, in case you didn't notice. Uh, he's a lot taller than I am. Um, he, uh, he is uh, on uh, just an incredible trip right now to uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, where he is doing some recon uh, for our trip that we'll be doing as a church next October. Uh, so he's over there with another uh, um, United Methodist pastor, Brian uh, Erickson, and they're doing uh, some recon work for that, for that trip. So he won't be here this Sunday or next Sunday, uh, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, so if you'll join with me as we pray together. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for every single person who came out, who's joined us online. God, thank you for this beautiful fall day, the changing of the season, the, the Christmas in the air. God, we thank you that we get to come to a place, worship freely, love freely, that we get to come and study and learn together. We get to be in fellowship together and laugh and, and, and to shoulder each other's burdens. God, we know that there are people in our church community who are hurting this morning, hurting from loss, hurting from the news of difficult diagnosis. We know there are folks who are recovering this morning who are both in short and long recoveries. God, let us be a community that lifts our brothers and our sisters, our siblings up, holds them closely, and lets them know that they are loved deeply. Not only by our God, but by their church. God, we thank you that we get to be a community who both laughs together and cries together. God, we pray that we will hold that sacred space, invite others in, welcome others in, so that they too can feel what it feels like to be a part of the family of God. God, as we move forward in this worship, open our ears and our hearts, our minds to what you will have to say to us today. Give us the courage, not only to listen, but even more so the courage to act, to align ourselves with your good work in this world so that others may know the love and grace and goodness that you have for all of your creation. We do this because you first loved us, and we do this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, let's stand as we continue to sing and worship.
even the times where we feel worthless, we must let God remind us of our, of our worth. We are made in God's image. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all. gospel, uh, toward the beginning of John's gospel, um, two apostles were uh, pointed toward Jesus, and they knew Jesus was a rabbi, and they went up to Jesus and said, hey, show us where you've been staying, and Jesus, instead of answering them, said, come and see, and I think that that message is for us, too. Jesus says, come and see. It says, don't just, don't just hear these words and don't learn about it, but actually come and see what it's like where I am. And so as we sing this next song, Be Thou My Vision, let's ask for uh, a little glimpse of Jesus' eyes and what Jesus sees and what God sees.
my wisdom. for us to read this together and, and, and pray this together. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to the world around us. Show us what we should see, but from which we hide our eyes. Show us how people live in this world and the reality of their days. Give us courage to do what you ask and to come and see. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to the shape of your kingdom. Show us what life could be like if only we could see in wisdom. Show us what we could do to change things forever with you. Give us courage to have a vision and to come and see. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to the people all around us. Show us what we should see, but what we fail to notice. Show us what people are saying to us and what they long for. Give us courage to be where you are and to come and see. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Will you join me in our doxology? We're going to sing these words. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we'll sing this to the tune of all creatures of our God and King. to worship, grow, and serve, and uh, part of that growth is knowing each other. So let's take just a minute and greet the people around us.
All right, church, let's find our way back. So I want to I want to remind you guys. Um, we at the end of each row there is an attendance pad, a brown attendance pad, and if you don't mind signing in, that really helps us know as a church staff who it is that makes up this uh, community that we call Grace and who's here. And especially if you are a visitor, uh, we're not trying to like uh, we're we're not trying to track you down or come knock on your door, but we would love to just reach out with an email and uh, and and find out what questions you have about our our church and uh, find out how we can serve you. And so, yeah, please sign in if you don't mind. Uh, at this time, we are going to give back. Uh, it's part, something we do as part of worship every week. We give back um, a portion of the bounty that God has uh, poured out into our lives. And so our tithes and offerings, you can give as the plates, the offering plates will go around. You can also join uh, those who are online by uh, giving online at our website at, at uh, gracebhm.org. Let's give back. And know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will sing out hallelujah And we will cry out hallelujah We'll know that you are holy. Now all will sing out hallelujah, and we will cry out hallelujah. All will sing out hallelujah, and we will cry.
to the masses that he is God praise God Good morning, my name is Amanda Vernon. I'm the Director of Children's Ministries here at Grace and I want to invite the kids up to join me. Y'all waited that time. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like, okay, but this is good. While you're coming up, we're gonna talk really quick about, does anybody know what's happening at the church this week on Wednesday night? There's something special happening. Potluck, that's a good guess. Does anybody know? Trunk or treat, that's exactly right. So I just wanna remind everybody that trunk or treat is this week, yep, this Wednesday night. And we wanna invite all of you to join us, bring a friend. And also, um, you can go to the website, you can go to gracebhm.org and go to the children's tab and trunk or treat is right there, you can't miss it. And that's where you can sign up to help, but you can also sign up to purchase a hot dog supper and that would be great so we don't accidentally buy like 5,000 hot dogs or 20 hot dogs. If you're planning on having a hot dog, that would be awesome. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit kind of like that. We're gonna start with it being Halloween. I thought this might be a good question to ask. Does anybody have a favorite bad guy? It doesn't have to be like in the Bible. Like, do you have anyone, like a favorite, like villain or bad guy? Somebody you like? Look at y'all are so, oh, Noah has one, yeah. Clayface and the Joker. I know who the Joker is, I don't know who Clayface is. Do you have one? Darth Maul from Star Wars, what's your sweet girl? Darth Vader, that's a pretty good one. I gotta say, that's a pretty good one. Well, Amelia Clear, when she was like two or three, went through a phase where she loved bad guys. She would be like, can we watch that movie with Maleficent? And she didn't mean Maleficent, she meant Sleeping Beauty. And then she would be like, can we watch Lion King? And we were like, yeah. She was like, cause I wanna see Uncle Scar. And we were like, is she okay? But she's fine, she's probably fine. Um, but we're gonna talk a little more this week about our story of does anyone remember who we've been talking about the last couple weeks with the Queen Esther. Queen Esther, that's exactly right. So there was a, there was a, um, a bad guy in this story and his name is Haman, okay? Haman was kind of the bad guy in the story. And um, I, there's a lot of characters in the story actually and so I kept getting them confused and so in my mind I was like, hey man, why you gotta be so mean in the story? That was like kind of how I was remembering it. But before I even said that a couple weeks ago, do you guys know Ted? Ted was like, um, hey man. He was like, hey man, more like hate man. And I was like, yes, that's another good way to remember it. So, hey man, hate man, hey man, why are you so mean? That's how you can remember who he was. But in the story of Esther, he was like number two in command, and so he made everybody bow down to him, which is not, I know, right? It's not very nice, not very nice. And so Mordecai, which I don't have a way to like, I don't have any tricks for remembering his name, but Mordecai was Esther's cousin, and he would not bow down to Haman, and that made Haman so angry, like really angry, so angry that he didn't just say, Haman has to die, he said, I mean, Mordecai has to die, he knew that he was Jewish, and so he said, all the Jewish people have to die because I am so mad about this. And so um, that is just part of our story. I promise it works out. But um, the, the most important thing I want you all remember is that in that story, that sounds really bad, right? It sounds like it's pretty hopeless. But I want you guys to remember, and we're gonna talk about this a little more in children's church, but that God always has a plan and he is always on the side of the, powerless. He cares deeply for people who are hurting and for people who are oppressed and that um, he sees them and he cares about them. He loves them and they are not forgotten. Okay. So even when things seem really bad, God has planned. Okay. Will you guys pray with me and then we'll go to children's church. Does that sound good? Okay. Dear God, thank you for this day. And we thank you that when we're hurting and when we're sad, when we see bad things happening in the world, we can remember that you care and that you have a plan. 
And we pray this week that you would help us know how to love you with all of our hearts and how to love each other. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. I'm so uh, glad again to, to be with you uh, this morning in, in Tyler's absence. It's always a, a pleasure to be able to uh, get up here and, and, and share a little bit of time uh, with you. So we're uh, continuing our series, like Amanda said, uh, through the book of Esther. Uh, the, we're, we're called the series The Queen because she is the central uh, figure uh, in, in, the, in the story. And, and I don't assume that everyone was here on week one. Uh, where Tyler uh, kind of gave a, a quick run through of Esther. So I want to do that really quickly as we move into the sermon. Uh, Esther is <clears throat> not one of the most familiar books to us uh, in, in Christianity. It's, a, it's an important book, especially in Judaism. Uh, it's, we'll talk about that actually a little bit more next week. Uh, but it, it's not one that, that we uh, focus on a lot. And, and there's a couple reasons why. We're, we're not really familiar with the characters, partly because we don't see them anywhere else in the Bible, okay? It's not like uh, the Pentateuch where it's Moses and Joshua and, and you know, you, ha you have all these characters that are running over like a five book stretch, right? It's not, it's, 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 very, it's a very isolated book. And so characters like Haman and Mordecai and Xerxes and uh, Esther and, and, and all these folks, we only see them in this one book and so it's, it's not quite as familiar to us. The other reason why it's a little less familiar to us is because um, we don't preach on it a ton uh, in, in, in Christianity. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why is, is it's, a, it's a complicated book. Uh, it's a complicated book in terms of ethics. Uh, it's a complicated book in terms of when we, you know, it, it makes for hard children's moments, okay? Uh, <laughs> when you're like, yeah, the queen was asked to dance naked. It's like, how are you going to translate that into a children's moment, right? And so um, it, it's not one that we feel terribly comfortable preaching from a, a lot of times. So there's some reasons why we don't know it very well. But, but basically, here's a quick recap of the story. You got King Zersky, Xerxes, uh, which you probably have heard that name before. He has a different name uh, in the text, but we know that's who that is, okay? And so what's happened is he's had a party, his wife wouldn't do the dance, uh, literally the dance, um, not figuratively the dance, that'll come later in the story, and she uh, is banished. Okay, she's banished uh, through a series of events. Uh, this woman, uh, who is a Jewish woman named Esther, sort of rises up into, uh, into prominence, and, and, and especially in the eyes of King Xerxes. Uh, so uh, Esther kind of comes on the scene and begins to curry favor uh, with the king. Esther has a cousin whose name is Mordecai, who is also sort of her adopted father, okay? So Mordecai kind of plays two roles. He is a blood relation, but functions more as a father than as a cousin uh, to Esther in the story. So she finds favor with the king. I'll leave that to your imaginations. She finds favor with the king, right? So she uh, is now moved into the queen role, okay? She is, she is, uh, she is his... In this time period, there wasn't one, but she was his top one, okay? And uh, so as she moved up, Mordecai moves up as well. Mordecai gets into a power struggle with Haman, right? And I like that, hey man, don't be so mean. I like that a lot. Mordecai gets into a power struggle with Haman. The way to think about Haman is, uh, you remember the movie Aladdin? You guys remember that movie, the cartoon Aladdin? Haman is Jafar. Okay, if you can make that connection in your head, you got the character of Haman, all right? Haman's the right hand, he whispers things into the ear of the king uh, to, to lead the king astray, okay? So you've got a power struggle that, that started between uh, Mordecai and Jafar Haman. Uh, Haman has this angle where he uh, is wanting to get rid of Mordecai. He builds this giant gallows, 
okay, to hang Mordecai. Uh, but he decides to take it one step farther, as all truly bad guys do, and he says, I'm not only going to get rid of him, I'm going to wipe out his entire people. Now, what we got to remember is through this whole thing, Esther is not known by King Xerxes as a Jew. He doesn't know that she's connected with this group of people, okay? The king goes along with it because Jafar is whispering sweet nothings into the ear of the king, right? Jafar, Haman, is, you, you get it, right? So, what ends up happening is um, Esther is at a crossroads. She's at a, she's a fork in the road. She's at a point of decision. Do I continue to live into this nice kind of posh life that I've created for myself, or do I live into my true identity as the cousin, adopted daughter of Mordecai and overarching as a Jew? So she begins to kind of work, again, ethically questionable magic um, with, with the king, and uh, uh, she basically gets him to give her an IOU promise, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cash this IOU in at a later date. She, she curries this with the king. The king's like, cool. So a couple of banquets later, because um, all they do is party apparently, a couple of banquets later, she cashes it in and she reveals herself as a Jew. And uh, the king finds out some things that old Jafar has been doing, and now, uh, instead of Mordecai on the gallows that Haman built, Haman is on the gallows that Haman built, and the king gives permission to the Jews to not only exist freely, but to be able to defend themselves as well. You can see why it's such an important book in Judaism. You're looking at this moment of, of annihilation for their people. And you have this, this unlikely hero who rises up. Now, when we think about the Bible, <clears throat> we, we really do ourselves a disservice when we talk about verses in the Bible. Uh, because verses are good, chapters are good, books are good, but if we want to understand the Bible as a document, we have to think about overarching themes in the Bible. And we see a number of these overarching themes throughout the scripture, and, and the one that we want to lean into today, the one that we see literally from Genesis to Revelation, is the theme of power and powerlessness. I'm not even sure if powerlessness is a word, but we're going to use it today, okay? This theme of power and powerlessness, we see it all through the Bible. We see it with Moses, the, one of the, the origin story of the Jews, Exodus. This is a shepherd who's wanted for murder who goes and stands before the king of the greatest superpower in the world, Egypt, and says, let my people go. We see this with David. Now, David rose to prominence and got into a whole corruption thing himself, but David didn't start off with prominence. He started off as the youngest son, a shepherd boy in a field who ends up going and fighting a giant. We even see this with the, the character of Jesus. Jesus was not a king. He ended up being called, being called the king of the Jews, but Jesus was a carpenter from the backwoods of Galilee. You see this overarching theme with character after character, Rahab and Ruth and Naomi. You see this with character after character in the Bible where you have power among the powerlessness. So uh, this morning, uh, I want to talk about three systems of power that we see both in Esther's story, but I think translates really well into our stories as well. The first one is the powerlessness that we feel oftentimes in terms of our interaction with overarching systems and structures. You think about Esther. She lived not only in an autocracy, right? One dude could say, you're dead, you're not, okay? This is a, this is a, 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 a huge problem, right? You're at the whims of one person. But she also lived in a patriarchal society. So she had the double whammy, okay? She was a woman and in an autocracy. So she was in, uh, 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 she had the opportunity to say, I am completely powerless in this situation. Maybe if I was a man, I might be in his inner court and I can whisper something in his ear, but I'm a woman and I'm not in his inner court. I'm in the autocracy and the patriarchy. I have no power in this situation. But she didn't. 
She chose to see the opportunity in the systems and structures which otherwise could have made her feel incredibly powerless. Over the past four or five years, uh, we have been talking about this uh, as a nation, as communities of faith, uh, about systems of inequity and injustice that we see in our country. Uh, we, we've talked about, I mean, uh, the summer of 2020 was wrought. Uh, the news was wrought with um, uh, images of injustice and inequity. We talked about George Floyd. We talked about uh, 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 systems of oppression for the poor, uh, racial uh, profiling. We've talked about so many systems of injustice and inequity, and we can often feel so powerless in those. We can fight, we can, we can say things, we can post things on social media, but I think a lot of us go to bed at night going, I don't know how to make a difference in this. Powers and systems where women in our culture are still getting paid 60 cents to the dollar that a man makes. These are big systems. And it can be really easy to feel really powerless in those systems. Cultural systems uh, that, that, are, that are these structures and systems, cultural ones that are, that are things that we are, are, are less kind of those big meta narratives, but ones that we find ourselves in. How many of you have ever worked in a job that was toxic? It was a, yeah, people are like, do I raise my hand, do I not? Most of us, right? Most of us have been in those cultures and those systems that are, that are toxic, and, and it's so easy to feel powerless in those. It's, you just, you know, you, you get into this mode where you're just like, I'm just gonna put my head down, I'm gonna go to work, I'm gonna do the nine to five, or the eight to five, or the eight to six, or whatever, I'm gonna do it, and, and I'm gonna go home, and, and, and you get into this, we get into this rhythm where we feel powerless in our jobs. Sometimes we feel powerless where we live. Sometimes our neighborhoods, our communities have values and systems and structures that are not ours. But because we live there, because we pay a mortgage there, because our kids are in school there, whatever, we, we, we find a way just to kind of get through it. And we feel this powerlessness in these overarching systems and structures Sometimes uh, people, and I think this is happening less, but I, I think it's still a, a piece of the equation. Sometimes people will feel powerless because of the system and structures of their parents. I mean, if you've watched American Idol or one of those kinds of shows, right, the singing shows, every season you have a, a, a few people who get up and you're like, oh, I wonder if they're gonna be any good, and they're not, like they're bad, right? They're not like, oh, maybe they get to go to LA, maybe they don't, no, these people are bad, they have no, they have, they're like me, I have no reason to have a microphone and sing, okay? They're bad. But somewhere along the way, great granddad, right before he died, said, you're the best singer ever, and you, your singing just keeps me alive. And this little four-year-old thought, I gotta keep singing, because granddad, I gotta keep granddad alive. And something in their head, right, made them go, I gotta sing. But everybody else knows they shouldn't have sang, right? <laughs> they, they're really good at math, right? <laughs> Not a good singer. But something that happens in our past, our parents, our grandparents, somebody locks us into something and tells us we're really good at something or we're, or we're terrible at something. I don't know if you remember the movie Dead Poet Society. It was one of my favorite movies as a kid. I loved it. I loved Robin Williams' character, I loved the whole plot, but, but there's one character in it who, uh, whose dad was really strict, right? He was that classic 1950s, like straight line kind of dad, and he, um, he, his son wanted to be an actor. I don't remember the plot. His son wanted to be an actor, he wanted so badly, he was good at it, and he was celebrated as an actor at school, and his dad came and he saw him in his performance, and instead of celebrating him, he chewed him out. He, he said, I'm taking you out of this school. I'm taking you. You, can, you can't do that anymore. You're going to be a doctor. Some of us have had people in our lives who represent systems and structures who have held us and pigeonholed us into certain places where we feel powerless, where we feel unable to, to break out, unable to live outside of the, the rules and the rhythms Here's the thing, though. None of those have power over, over you. 
Your job doesn't have power over you. What your, what your mom or dad said or did, your grandparents, some really jerk uncle, it doesn't have power over you. You have the option. We have the option. We have the option not just for these personal systems and structures, but for societal ones. We can say, I'm going to be a witness to justice in my communities, in my friend groups, in my neighborhoods, in my country. We have power even when we feel powerless. We have to remember that we always have a choice. But sometimes, maybe even a lot of times, those choices come with real consequences and costs. But we still have a choice. The second system of powerlessness that I think we can explore in Esther is, is, um, is powerlessness in relationships. Relationships with family and friends and frenemies. These relationship structures that we have each and every day that we're interacting with, that we're moving in and out of. And, and Esther, she was married to the king. She was a queen. She had an opportunity to come up under that umbrella and live the rest of her life. To come up under the umbrella of that relationship with him and not have to worry anymore. She didn't have to reveal who she was. She didn't have to reveal uh, who she was connected to. She didn't have to stand up, but, but she chose to do something different. A lot of us are in relationships that we don't want to be in. Every one of us has a friend that's not a friend, right? Every one of us has a friend who does not build us up, who does not support us, but hurts us, harms us, cuts us down. Every one of us have relationships that are harmful, but we stay in them because we feel like we have to. We have a couple of, we have a couple of options here. One, I think we have the option to ask the question of our relationships, is, is it me, is it them, or is it us? I'm talking about friendships, I'm talking about relationships, I'm talking about any kind of relationships. Is it me, is it them, or is it us? When we ask the question if it's me, I think that's, I think that's a good place to start. Because that's the place we have the most control over. It's the place where we actually have the most power. And we have to ask those questions of how, what's our MO in this situation? What's our modus operandi? How do we operate in this relationship? I can look at times in, in mine and my wife, Mary Liz and I have been married for 21 years. And if you've been married for two years, you know that it, things go in waves, right? Where you're really, really happy and, and you're both just floating on cloud nine. And then there are days where you're just grumpy and, and, and it takes it takes a pin drop to create an argument. It's in those moments where we have to first say, how am I entering into this relationship? Am I coming home expecting for there to be problems? Am I coming home annoyed, waiting for someone that I can take my annoyance out on? Am I coming home participating in these cycles? So we got to ask the question of our own MO, examine ourselves. How am I operating this system? There's times when it has very little or nothing to do with us, though. There are times when uh, people are in abusive relationships, where we have to say, no, there's something else that's happening there as well. I remember I was doing, uh, I wasn't even supposed to do this girls, junior high girls Bible study one morning. The speaker didn't show up. We had this before school Bible study. This was years ago. Um, speaker didn't show up, and so uh, the woman who was sort of the facilitator of it, she said, hey, Stephen, uh, speaker's not coming. They got the flu. 
can you jump in and do something for us? I was like, absolutely. So I was there already. So I jumped in and I was like, what am I going to tell these junior high girls? And I remember uh, a coach uh, from, uh, from high school, Coach Ball. And Coach Ball used to say, he coached girls basketball, he helped out with football, but he, I remember him telling the girls, listen, if you got a, girl, if you got a guy who's, uh, who's not treating you well, man, you got to kick that guy to the curb. He would say it all the time, you got to kick that guy to the curb. And so I decided that morning I was going to talk about Coach Ball and, uh, and, and tell these junior high girls, hey, if you got someone in your life who's not treating you the way that you deserve to be treated, kick them to the curb. And they're kind of, you know, I'm making it funny, they're kind of giggling. And I look, and the woman who, um, who facilitated that group is sitting in the back and she's crying. So we talk afterwards, and long story short, she was in an abusive relationship. Had no clue. I've worked with this woman for years. No clue. She found power where she felt completely powerless. And it was purely because someone said, you don't have to take that. Kick him to the curb. There's cost. There's consequence. We have power. The third area of powerlessness that we often feel, but often don't recognize, is powerlessness with ourselves. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. Esther, all the way up until the end, was not truly herself. She wasn't truly living into her full identity, who God had made her to be. And it's, I believe it's only at that moment where she stood up and said, I am one of them. And if you are going to love me, you're going to respect me, if you're going to give me power, then you also have to give them power. Talking about her people, the Jews. Oftentimes we are horrible. We're our own worst enemies because we hide. We are the ones who hamstring ourselves so often. We do this in multiple ways. One is with the inner voice. Most of us have an inner voice, and it's doing one of two things usually. It's either lifting us up and building us up when we really shouldn't be. It's called narcissism. And the other one is beating us down, making us feel like less than we truly are. And that's called self-abuse. And most of us function in some place along that spectrum. Either we think a little too much of ourselves, or we think a little too little of ourselves. We have to get control of the inner voice. Now, here's one thing I know. Our parents have a big, if we, if we, if we kind of dissect that voice, a lot of times we'll find it's our parents in one way or another. Either our parents were like, oh, sweet little so-and-so, you're just the best. I know you stole that candy bar, but it's probably their fault anyways, right? <laughs> that leads over here. You can't do anything right. You're just a screw up. Your sister's so much smarter than you. Why can't you be like so and so? I was an athlete, why aren't you? And we function somewhere on that spectrum. And that inner voice continues to speak to us, either building us up in ways, in ways that call cycles of arrested development or cuts us down to where we can never fully reach and see our true potential. Another piece, and this is a really sensitive piece, is, is addiction. Addiction is, is one of those pieces, one of, my, one of my very best friends has been in recovery for over a decade, and, and we talk about this, and, and he talks about, he says, in, in my worst moments, I'm my own worst enemy. And so addiction, I think, falls into the same category. And last but not least, uh, some of you know about the Enneagram. Uh, Enneagram is a, 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 a personality self-evaluation tool. It's several thousand years old. I believe deeply in it. It's a really helpful thing. But we have these ways that we move in the world. I'm a seven. 
on the Enneagram. And, and what a seven means is that I want, and this goes back to Dead Poets, so I probably reason why I liked it so much. You remember the Robin Williams where he's quoting the poet? He says, I want to suck the marrow out of life. You remember that? That's a seven. That is like the M-O of a seven. Others are the perfectionists. They find their value and their identity through everything being just right and them being the ones who make it just right. Some are the two, which is the helper. They find their joy in serving others, but not themselves. Some are the three on the Enneagram, which is the winner, and they can only understand their own worth and identity through being successful and winning. Some are the four. The fours find their identity and their, uh, their value in being unique. The fives find it in knowing and understanding. And if they can't know and understand, then they don't feel worth. The six is all about preparation and making sure that everything is ready in case. The seven, as I've already talked about, uh, it just they, they, we find our identity and our worth and be able to experience everything and live life to its absolute fullest. The eight, there's only nine of these, by the way. The eight <laughs> finds their worth by pushing against and pushing and making, creating space, being the challenger. And then the nine finds their worth and identity with just not having any wants or desires and being able to move and meld. We limit ourselves when we live into that, when we let that identity, whatever your desire is that you heard just now, we limit ourselves when we let that be the thing that brings us value instead of our createdness, instead of our belovedness. This is what I'm gonna close with, I know we're, we're at time. We talk about three different kinds of power, but Esther is also a cautionary tale. It is really easy for us in Esther to read ourselves into the roles of Esther and Mordecai. The poor Jews, the oppressed, the ones who have to fight for their right to survive. What we also need to realize is that for many of us, in some levels of our lives. We don't need to read ourselves into the role of Esther and Mordecai, but we need to understand that many of us in many realms of our lives are King Xerxes. We're the powerful. We're the ones who have the ability to make decisions. We're the ones who have influence. And so this is a cautionary tale don't automatically read yourself into the oppressed, although in some places in your life you might be. You might be marginalized, you might be powerless, but also remember that we have to understand this cautionary tale speaks to us on another level as well. Are we using our power to benefit minority voices among us? Are we using our influence to create spaces for others, different ideas, different perspectives, even dissent? Do our, do our decision, decisions reflect the nature of keeping the status quo? Or are our decisions fair, thoughtful, and equitable in our places of power? We have to be people of self-reflection and honesty. We have to be open to being presented with our blind spots and even our ignorances. And the final thing of the story is that we have to remember that the, the, the goal of the power, of gaining power for the powerlessness is not to become the dominant one. It's not the goal of the story. It's not the goal, it's not what you see in the overarching themes of the Bible. It's not that the oppressors become the oppressed. Elie Wiesel warned us of that. Elie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, he warned us of that. He said, it's so easy for the oppressed to become the oppressor so that they will never be oppressed again. That's not the goal of the text. That's not the goal of the theme. The goal is e equality, equity, belonging, and justice. Ultimately, no matter where we find ourselves, this is a story of hope. It's hope for the powerlessness, for the powerless. And in the case of King Xerxes, it's hope that we too can change and see the world through the eyes of justice and fairness and equality. Let's pray.
God, thank you for this challenging story. God, we thank you that you're not the God who relies on the power of kings, but you are the God who demonstrates your powerfulness through the lives of peasants, shepherds, oppressed women, minorities, people who stutter, people who see no way out and no hope. God, we thank you that we have hope because of you. Give us the courage to stand into that hope and give us the courage to see when we sit on the throne of the King. Amen. Church, let's stand. Let's sing together. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fix your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. Though I am small, my God, my all, you work great things in me. And your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame And to those who would for you yearn You will show your might, put the strong to flight For the world is about to turn My heart shall sing of the day you ring Let the fires of your justice burn Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near And the world is about to turn Though the nations range from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's crushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and a rod can be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. My heart, my heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. place knowing that you have choices, knowing that you have power even when you feel like you are powerless, and knowing that the God who loves you gives you hope in hopeless situations, and remembering that sometimes we're not Esther and Mordecai, we're the king. Go forth from this place being blessed. Amen. Amen.